redwood forests. They're like nothing else on earth. Ancient giants reaching towards the sky, light filtering through the canopy. It's a photographer's dream, right? The truth is I've spent more time on trails and amongst the trees than all the beaches, mountains, canyons, fields, deserts, dunes, and waterfalls that I visited combined. Forests and trees in general are the landscapes that I feel the most affinity for. And yet my portfolio of them is sorely lacking. If I'm being honest, I've pretty much avoided the hard work of a dedicated deep dive into forest photography, unless the composition practically hit me over the head. There's something that's just really challenging about forest photography and I've never really tackled it head on. The endless details, especially in the Pacific Northwest, and the immense scale, especially in a place like the Redwoods, it's just so demanding and feels like it's almost impossible to do justice to the majesty of what it feels like just standing here. But I'm determined to change that. On the weeks leading up to this trip, I spent a lot of time reading articles, studying forest photos, analyzing the work of the masters and trying to distill the techniques. As I explore the redwoods over the next couple of days, I'll try to incorporate those techniques to overcome my frustrations with forest photography. Hopefully. I took a pretty systematic approach. I dug deep into the portfolios of some of the best forest photographers out there, analyzing hundreds of their images to try and uncover what makes them tick. I looked for patterns, recurring elements, and those little details that elevate a good photo into something truly special. From there, I selected a few that represented a particular concept or technique, especially the ones suited for redwoods photography, and looked at composition, lighting, subject matter, and even the mood that they evoke. As I went through this process, some key concepts and techniques started to emerge. If I could even begin to crack the code on photographing forests, it would open up a whole new world of possibilities closer to home. And I've learned that pushing past my comfort zone is where creative growth happens. So no more putting this off. Let's dive in. I've read countless articles by renowned landscape photographers who emphasize the importance of patience and observation, especially in forests. They talk about connecting with the environment before even thinking about composition. Today, I'm putting that advice to the test. Instead of rushing to find the perfect shot, I'm gonna slow down, take a few deep breaths, and really try to connect with this place before I even pull out my camera, being content just being here in a new and beautiful place. Technique number one is less of a technique and more of a mindset shift, a shift from rapid composition seeking to patient observer and empathizer. In the past, whenever I entered a forest, my first instinct was to just start snapping away, scavenging for whatever I could find. But I've learned that rushing in with forest photography rarely leads to good photos. I spent the next 30 minutes or so just taking it all in. It was strange at first keeping my camera in its bag, but there was something nice about just connecting with the place and experiencing it without the distraction of gear. One of the toughest things about forest photography is creating a sense of depth. It's so easy for everything to feel flat and one dimensional. When I looked at immersive forest photos, many of them were shot in fog or mist. It's a beautiful effect, but it got me thinking, how can I create depth without relying on weather conditions? Without fog, we need other ways to communicate depth. Of the images that I looked at that didn't include fog, they all used some other means to communicate depth, whether that was creative framing, using leading lines, shooting towards the light, 
a wide angle lens might exaggerate the foreground and create a sense of depth using a big to small transition, while a telephoto could compress the background and make it easier to highlight a change in color or tonality. What I'm trying to do here is just use shade uh, to communicate depth and using natural framing, we have sort of a darker brown trunk here and on the other side, maybe I can zoom out a little bit in video, the cropping's a little different. And then we have this redwood over there that has a different coloration. And that change from these darker trunks into this central, I think it works. This log going through adds a little bit of interest. The ferns that are larger in the foreground and smaller in the distance, all these things help to communicate depth. I decided to jump in the frame for a little human scale. One of the ways I'm trying to create depth is to use some foreground interest. So in this case, these maple leaves can help with a few things. One is communicating some depth, some interest, also covering up some of the white spots up top. Of course, this means that I need to focus stack when there's a foreground this close. And it also means that my shutter speed needs to be a little bit faster because these are just slightly moving. So I'll have to experiment. And if something's moving and you're focus stacking, that can cause all kinds of issues later in post. So we shall see. I may also just try to shoot this at like F22. That way, if the focus stack doesn't work, you still have something. Sometimes the best forest photos aren't just about trees, they're about stories. Each tree has its own personality, its own history etched into the bark. With the grand vistas in landscape photography, the subject is often obvious, but with forests, that's usually not the case. When looking at great forest photos, I notice how some photographers manage to capture the personality of individual trees, making them feel like characters in a story. It's a fascinating approach, and I want to see if I can do the same. I've been trying to focus on finding that really special thing that could be the main character. You know, with redwoods, a lot of them are sort of straight, but some of them are twisted and knurled and have all kinds of burls on them. This one here, or really interesting texture into the bark, like that one up there. came across these really cool, twisted, amazing trees with a lot of character. Driving through the park, I noticed a tree that seemed to be lit by two different light sources, creating a really unique look. Along the drive, I saw a group of big leaf maples that look like a wretched, wicked old hand. But the composition is extremely busy, and I don't think it works. Forests can feel so chaotic, so overwhelming. But amidst all of that, there's often a hidden structure, a sense of order waiting to be revealed. And that's what this next focus is all about, structure. When analyzing the photos that I enjoyed the most, one aspect stood out above all others, structure. I'm gonna focus on finding those dendritic patterns and spacing of trunks, and then I'm gonna simplify, exclude the unnecessary, and let that structure guide the composition. Since I couldn't remove the distracting light, I decided to embrace it and angle the camera upwards. Drawn to the backlit, moss-laden vine maples, I worked the scene until I found a composition that felt well-structured. Light is everything in photography, and that's no different in a forest. 
After analyzing how great forest photographers harness light, I came to a couple realizations. First, I think it's helpful to break down light into three categories. Spotlight, directional light, and non-directional light. Spotlighting can create some truly magical moments when light pierces through the canopy and illuminates a specific subject. Those are gold, but they can also be fleeting, so you have to be ready to capture them when they happen. If you have directional light, that gives you a lot to work with. But harsh direct light, like on a sunny blue sky day, is best captured around golden hour. You can even capture sun rays without fog. With softer, more diffuse directional light, your shooting window is much longer. For either type of directional light, backlight and side light seem to work best. What then about those overcast days when the light is so soft and diffused that it loses all directionality? Well, that's where things get a little trickier. On one side, it's great because your shooting window expands considerably, but without that directional light, you need to find other ways to create depth and dimension in your photos, like the techniques I covered earlier. So it is three o'clock, sort of middle of the day. I wouldn't expect to be out during this time, um, but it did get overcast. It was really harsh, contrasty light for the first part of the day, and then some clouds rolled in I was hoping we'd get some fog. So far, no fog in the redwoods. But the overcast conditions do make for soft light. It's almost too soft where everything really blends in. I mean, you're fighting for depth here. I do prefer a little bit more contrast. You kind of want, you kind of just want fog. You want the light, but you want diffusion. That's beautiful carpet of clovers. So one of the problems with overcast dull light is that there's no sense of direction of light, which is one of the most important qualities of light is its direction that it's coming from and going to. Um, even without your sun rays going through the scene, you still want to feel like the light is clearly coming from one direction and you have to try to look for little pockets where the light is hitting, or that's at least what I'm trying to do. Here, I arranged the scene so the tree trunks were nicely separated and the light was mostly concentrated in the center part of the frame. If the fog doesn't come to you, go to it. I decided to drive higher up in elevation on one of the forest roads and ended up driving into a low cloud which provided some nice diffusion. Working with light is as much about how you use the light as it is about how you reduce its distracting effects. Taming distracting light starts with the basic acknowledgement that our eyes are drawn to the lightest parts of an image. That usually means trying to reduce or remove the sky, shooting in overcast or foggy conditions, or using a telephoto lens to isolate subjects and avoid those distracting bright spots. Clouds lifted closer to sunset. So I took advantage of the directional light. Here, I paid special attention to removing the bright spots in the canopy. On my third and final morning in the Redwoods, I'd almost given up, but the forecast looked promising, so I got up early again and took off into the trees. And it was foggy, creating a whole new set of opportunities for capturing depth and light. I was thankful that I got to practice under more banal conditions over the past two days. And it was now time to bring it all together. Okay, so the fog is hanging around and just really trying to focus on separation of trunks. Here. I don't know if you can make it out, but in the back there, there's this really nice kind of fallen tree. It's still kind of hanging on. And it makes for a really nice central subject. 
I ended up finding another snag that stood out more and had some nice rhododendron in front of it. I'm kneeling on the ground, looking up, hoping for some sun rays. They're about ready to burst through. I'm not sure if it'll happen, but I've got this nice composition. Such a beautiful glow. The diffuse light made it okay to point straight up to the sky. But the light rays were still hiding. While I dreamed of sun rays, I put on the telephoto in hopes of finding some of the smaller details. I found this lovely patch of rhododendron, so broke out my wide angle. And I had almost given up hope on light rays but they finally made an appearance and they were gone before I knew it. So I'm glad I got this shot when I did. When it's foggy like this, all of my attempt at being patient just goes completely out the window and I'm just running around like a kid in the candy store. I mean, look at this. It's like a fairy tale in here. I really love this tree with the ferns growing on it right here. I wonder if I can use that as a main character somehow. See if we can get separation of trunks. Yeah, I'd like to remove the trail if possible. I followed a few animal trails and found a nice scene with a branch leaning into the frame. Well, the fog has finally burned off. It's past noon. That was so good. The fog kept rolling in and out. The sun poked through a few times. That was just amazing. Three hours or so, just photographing nonstop, responding to the light, enjoying the fog. There was a bunch of photographers here. I did get to try some of the techniques that I set out to try. I'm excited to see how those turn out. Uh, it was really an amazing morning. After a few days of exploring and experimenting, I'm happy to say that I learned a lot. I've had my share of struggles, but I also captured some images I'm really proud of. Most importantly, I've gained a deeper appreciation for the beauty and complexity of these incredible forests. Spending dedicated time on these techniques has helped me feel more prepared for my next forest photo album. I hope you also learn some new things that you can use to make photographing forests more enjoyable and successful. If you're feeling inspired to plan your own forest photography trip, check out my video on the five must-have apps for landscape photography. To help you plan your trips, find those hidden gems, and make the most of your time in nature. Thanks for joining me on this adventure and I'll see you in the next one.